We are alive, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. You know, I've been struggling with information and data, specifically the last few years. I'm a huge fan of research, and I'm a big fan of the scientific method. Basically, instead of trying to prove that I'm right, I want to find out if I can disprove my thesis and see if I was wrong. Now, again, if you, most of you have been here for quite a while, you'll recognize some of my more famous guests, people like Bruce Lipton, Tom Campbell. These were all cutting edge fringe scientists who for a good chunk or majority of their career, they were considered fringe or pseudoscience. Over the years, as the methodology advanced and often as the other scientists who were arguing with them passed away and died, their new thesis became the prevailing uh, axiom, effectively. And this has been very difficult to grasp with. And one of the things I've been struggling with is trying to understand the optimism of what the future might look like while dealing with the pessimism of where we are today, right now. Instead of just ranting and riffing, what I have here is called why most published research findings are false. This is the idea that mo you can't just ever trust the science. In fact, most of it's wrong. This is by John P. Leonidas. I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. This is one of the most cited research papers in history. It's actually required reading for many, even recording. I should check here. Oh, good. I still know what I'm doing, ladies and gentlemen. I know how to press the record button. I'm going to read you the summary, part of the, the bias potential that's in here. It's mostly focused on medical research, but it is really broad spectrum across all of the scientific studies. Now, this is some of the pessimism, and I want to lead into the thought I had just the other day about why this might be optimistic. So excuse me, this is going to be a bit more of just talking. I want to try to share a thesis again of how we go from the pessimistic when things that are so clearly recognizable as a more valuable truth in the scientific world where the leaders of those fields are being called pseudoscientists or fake news or it's false information it's misinformation let's let's take a, let's take a break and really try to find some credible resources again this is one of the most cited research papers in history okay so there's an increasing concern that most published research findings are false the probability that a research claim is true may depend on the study power and bias the number of other studies on the same question and importantly the ratio of true to no relationships among the relationships probed by each in scientific field so again excuse me here in this framework a research finding is less likely to be true when the studies conducted in a field are smaller when effect sizes are smaller when the greater number and lesser pre-selection of tester relationships where there's greater flexibility in design, definitions, outcomes, analytical modes, when there's greater financial and other interests in the prejudice. Hold on a second. So you're telling me when there's great financial interest in the prejudice of what that scientific research paper is looking for, it's actually gonna define the result? Who would have thought? And when more teams are involved in a scientific field in chase of the statistical significance from that financial prejudice. Simulations show that for most studies, designs, and settings, it is far more likely that a research claim is actually false than true. Moreover, many scientific fields claimed research findings may often be simple, simply accurate measures of prevailing bias. Let me say this one more time. Claimed research may often simply be accurate measures of the prevailing bias. So what does this what does this mean for someone like myself who's so fascinated in finding the kind of like next gen of cutting edge truth or the value proposition of knowing something that others don't in the age of venture capital it's one of like our strong suits trying to find out what the hell is really valuable before everybody else knows that it's even a thing okay so first off i want to recognize that is extremely important, N never trust the science. Anyone who tells you that is clearly not that well researched because they've probably never read this. <laughs> this will actually be linked in the articles down below. Again, you must remember uh, what all I'm citing here is scientific research um, and this is one of the most cited papers in, in human history. As I started to go down this path further and further, 
my earlier interests were in things that were somewhat fringe to begin with. My interests in psychedelic mushrooms and the use of those for things like depression or treating anxiety started when I was like 15 or 16 years old. In fact, I dropped out of high school because I felt that it was clear to me that the evidence that I had from just taking the mushrooms versus the evidence that we would get from the people who were telling us, all oh, these are drugs are bad for you and blah, blah, blah. They were clearly full of shit. And that set me along this path where I got to somewhere today. Now, I've been struggling deeply because there are uh, a massive amount of fraudulent findings in the scientific research that is holding our society back. So to further this idea, I wanted to share two key scientists that I've followed along my way. The first one being Max Planck. He was the discoverer of what we now know as modern day quantum theory. And I'm just gonna give you a little short, brief kind of storytelling about his life so that you may understand how these things fit in context. When Max first joined, his professor told him, hey Max, you probably don't wanna join physics because literally everything in this field has already been discovered. This is the first step that most dogmatic, religious, arrogant scientists make. They think that what they know to be truth is the prevailing truth and it will remain that way. When in, as a matter of fact, over time, almost every single theory has been broken and we've come up with new prevailing ideas. He won two Nobel Prizes in his lifetime for the discovery of quantum physics, but for the majority of his career, he was dubbed a pseudoscientist. When he was giving some of his speeches around his Nobel Prize winning quantum physics, his advancement of how we understand subatomic particles and their relationship with each other and the potential for abstract things like strange movement at a distance. It's a whole field of study you could dive into here. One of the things he said that I thought was hyper important to understand and really to try to internalize as someone like myself who's interested in finding that fringe forward thinking truth. He said this, and I'm paraphrasing here. He says, science evolves one funeral at a time. Now, again, this is a paraphrase of his exact quote, but what it highlights is something extremely important. And it goes back to the professor that was telling him he shouldn't join physics because everything was already largely known about physics. Is that when you grow up, if you were the teacher of this said thing, and that said thing now becomes largely falsifiable, you will hold on to that paradigm to your last dying breath because you have now spent your entire life teaching people shit that is not true. The only way we get past that isn't by new prevailing evidence, it's by the death of all the people who are getting in the way of the paradigm shift itself. This is a, something I've had to try to take in deeply, deeply into my heart lately so that I don't get extraordinarily angry with what's happening when you can tell that there is so much clearly falsifiable data coming out of the mainstream scientific narrative and you have papers and you have scientist after scientist after scientist who have met these roadblocks in their life where effectively they're told, hey, what you're believing is BS, and then over the course of their lifetime they are vindicated because there's really no one left to argue with them. Which brings me to my next conversation and favorite science. J. Harlan Bretz. He's a, this is another really, I think, poignant story along this line. He was an American geologist. And in the early 1900s, as he was watching some of the areas in the northwest of the United States, he, he decided to start a theory around these massive, unimaginable, gigantic floods that scoured the landscape. For most of his career, he had to argue against people. So he had what was called the, the Spokane floods, and it was, I'm gonna read you from this part, as an, the outrageous hypothesis. So in the early summer of 1922, for the next few years, Bretz conducted his field research on the Columbia River Plateau. Between 1922 and 1933, he wrote 15 papers. Since 1910, he was interested in this unusual erosion features. Again, if you're interested in this topic of geomorphology, I highly suggest it. It's one of my favorite scientific conversations. If you're a weirdo like me and like spending their weekends and reading scientific journals, hey, it's Theo, it's Sunday, what are you doing? Reading scientific literature. 
If you're like me, you might enjoy this conversation as well. So since 1910, he had been focusing on the topographic maps and the potholes and cataracts within this particular area. Bretz had coined the term the Channel of Scablands. I'm sure many of you will remember this or even know of this area if you live near Seattle or Washington or maybe up in Canada. It's near the Grand Coulee, Coulee Cataract, effectively. And it's these massive erosions that move through basalt deposits, which are extraordinarily tough. So to get potholes the size of my truck, you need hundreds, if not thousands of feet of water above that. There's very few ways to get that much water, and at the time, the prevailing thesis was this gradualistic version of erosion. The problem with this is, is it doesn't fit the evidence of how we got here. So, there is an area of desert that Brett's theories required this cataclysmic water flows to form the landscape, which he termed, the, at that particular moment, called the, the Spokane Floods. Bretz published a paper in 1923 arguing that the channel scablands in eastern Washington were caused by massive flooding in the near to distant past. This was arguing for catastrophic explanations of the, the geology, again, where the prevailing thesis was uniform, uniformitarianism, where things just happened slowly, flood after flood after flood after flood over thousands of years, instead of one big could smash your face into the ground, destroy absolutely everything moment, which is actually what we find evidence for. You find, we have no more woolly mammoths, we have no more giant gland sloths, we have no more saber-toothed tigers. In fact, we lost all those animals in the blink of an eye somewhere around 11,200 to 13,000 years ago. But let's stay focused on J. Harlan Brett here, T.O. So, as much of the nature of the Ice Age was vastly understood at this time, Brett's original research was vindicated, and by the 1950s, his conclusions were also vindicated. Brett's had encountered enormous resistance to his theories from the geolo uh, geological establishment of the day, claiming that such a sweeping theory for the origin of the broad landscape for a variety of reasons, a, a a lacking the familiarity of the prevailing thesis in the remote Pacific Northwest was not research-based, is what the, the, the general public of scientists um, claimed. So, the last part here is one of the most interesting, and this is very similar to Max Planck. After Max had run the Nobel Prize, he basically came out and said, well, look, I didn't really get my thesis like uh, accepted by the community until all of the people who disagreed with me died. Okay, so Brett went on finally to receive the Penrose Medal at the age of 96. So think about this. His entire life, he had to stand up against people who were telling him he was wrong, that it was misinformation, it was disinformation, it was fake science. He was a pseudoscientist. And he won the highest prize in geology, the Penrose Medal. And upon winning this war award, his son had asked him on stage, please, like, tell us, what's your thoughts? And this is his quote. He says, I was excited, I wanted to gloat, but everybody who disagreed with me is dead. This is almost an exact echo of Max Planck. And today, I've struggled so deeply with what is happening in our society because there's clear evidence that things have gone wrong and people are not accepting it because it doesn't fit the uniformitarianism thesis of the, someone's political agenda today. And it is disgusting to me. So I wanted to talk about why I'm optimistic. <laughs> this was the pessimistic part. This motherfucker had to wait like 90 years basically for his younger self thesis to be vindicated to go, hey, I wanted to gloat, but now everybody who disagreed with me is dead. So yay. <laughs> I don't want to wait that long. I don't want to wait till everybody who disagrees with me is dead to go, ha, I was right. So I wanted to look at it from the, what does the future self see? Knowing that I will be vindicated, that one day truth will be the prevailing thesis instead of the dogmatic religious scientism that exists around trust the science today. Okay, breathe to you. This is a very emotional conversation for me because I've spent my life studying science. I dropped out in high school, but I spend almost every weekend reading scientific literature from geomorphology to physics to mathematics to medicine. Anything that I think that might be valuable where the prevailing dogmatic thesis is being challenged, I'm right there and interested because I find it fascinating. 
Okay, so for the, the optimistic part of this conversation, we'll, we'll go outside, somewhere where the beauty of, of nature is a significantly stronger artifact of the ideas that we're, we're trying to get across. So, I was having a conversation with some friends the other day. There we go, there's some good light now. And I was talking about this idea of cymatics. Now, cymatics in itself isn't really a science. For those of you that don't know though, when I was younger, we looked at waveform and thought it looked like the ocean, that there was simply an up and down, well rather, from down to up, back to down wave, when it was rather two dimensional. But if you go and look up or type in C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, cymatics, effectively what they do is they'll take a thin metal plate and they'll pour sand on it randomly so that you just have a bunch of random particles of sand in random shapes and relationships to one another. And underneath that metal plate, they, they put a high-powered, intensely loud piezoelectric speaker. And what that does is it allows you to go through these really um, potent frequency sweeps. As you do that, what you'll notice is this, the sound creates a beautiful geometric shape and form. And as a matter of fact, sound isn't just an up and down wave, but it creates a beautiful symmetry. Now, every time you hit a very unique pocket of this vibration, all of the particles of sand come together, they touch one another, and they become a unified portion of this form and function that is the geometry that we know today. So, as you move through the frequencies, what you'll notice is the sound creates beautiful uniform function and connection between all the sand particles, but as you move up, through the frequency, what you'll recognize is that slowly all of the sand disassociates from each particle to the next. So instead of this beautiful unified function, basically, you have dissonance. And you asked, each particle separates itself from one another. And what's unique here is that's what we see in society today. Everybody effectively puts themselves into little boxes and they no longer want to like it be close to one another. They're just, they're close. They're still somewhat in connection and relationship with each other, but they're not anymore. And just before you get to the next frequency above, when things are the most dissonant, in, a, in an instant, the entire shape transforms and you have a unified form again, a new geometric shape or solid that displays itself within the sound as a a 3D um, image almost. Again, I was, pr I think this is still one of the most interesting aspects of sound. It leads to the ideas of, hey, there's probably a huge amount of importance for sound as medicine or as intention and vibration. And this is the optimistic viewpoint right now, is that when things in society become so dissonant, when everybody is the most disconnected, it is very likely that we are on the verge of a new shift in our reality, in our paradigm. So although there are so many things for me to be upset about, and I am deeply concerned, I am I, I'm disturbed basically beyond degree from the gaslighting around these ideas that are taking place, and without getting censored from YouTube, I, the name, the, the drugs that shall not be named, the data and the meta-analysis that goes alongside all of this stuff has been completely ignored, and people are being harmed. I'm so angry, but on the bright side, from at least what I understand about vibration, this gearing towards dissonance on the other side of this story is hopefully a new renaissance. And I believe very strongly that if we were able to pass over this properly, for those of you that survive <laughs> the uh, scientific cullings, for those of the people that survived to make it through into the new generation of the axiom of truth, there's something better on the other side. I believe that if we were to do that, our understanding of energy, our understanding of how we function as humans, what we could do together, travel interstellar space is probably just a few steps away. So although I am deeply pessimistic and very deeply disturbed and concerned, there's this level of optimism from this vision of cymatics that has me moving forward to each side. So, anyway, just a quick vlog. You know, I try to keep the scientific and rant updates as few and as far between. 
because I, it's, I know how hard it is on me. I can't imagine how difficult it might be for other people. Anyways, just a quick little update on uh, the collapse of the society potentially and what to look forward afterwards. Anyways, to the RK Bear. See you in the next episode. Woo!